tapping on their shoulder if we get to 91 or 92. <laughs> At the discretion of the moderator, a 30-second rebuttal may be offered if a candidate happens to call out another candidate on a particular issue. That will be at my discretion. The questions will be asked in alternating order, first in ballot order for the first question, the next will be in reverse order, and so on. There are no handouts that are going to be given during the presentation, so we ask that you remain in your seats for the entire evening. At this time, I would like to introduce the candidates in order of ballot order. Would you please welcome Judy Lord. Judy Ward. 
Aside from tax cuts and overall oh, tax cuts, are we going to do opening? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> opening statements with Judy Ward first. Let's hope that's the only phone call that. I would like to thank all of you for being here this evening. And I'm going to start off by uh, addressing some of the things that were said um, at the end of our last session last week at the East Green and Fire Hall. Um, one of the things that was said about me talked about special interest money. And I wanted to talk about what is a special interest. If anybody has given money to the Cancer Society, maybe the NRA, those are special interest groups. The special interest groups that have supported me are the Pennsylvania Chamber, Pennsylvania Bankers Association, CPAs, nurse practitioners, and physicians assistants. Why would they donate to me? They appreciate my business and my medical expertise, as well as my conservative voting record. And I might add that Senator Eichelberger was listed in that group. Let's talk about the claim that you need to do more as a state senator than just ride in parades. To answer that, I would direct all of you to my Facebook page. People comment all the time about all of the things I do, all the places I am, and all the people that I'm able to be with and to help. I would say that the proof is in the pudding. I've been able to help so many people in my office. We're problem solvers. Anyone that steps into my office, myself and my staff go out of our way to assist them. I feel I am a true advocate for my constituents. I've been able to also assist many communities with community development grants, as well as water and sewer upgrades. I was able to assist Nason Hospital in acquiring a grant to upgrade their OR facilities to make them more competitive. I was able to assist ABCD Corp in a grant to de develop the old Warnico building to bring much needed space for jobs into our community. <coughs> I work with legislators on both sides of the aisle on legislation that makes our commonwealth a better place. I look forward to this evening and I hope that you will see the differences in experience and conservative values in the candidates in this race for the 30th Senate District. Thank you. Next will be Dan Kiss. Good evening, everyone. Lois, thanks for having another event. We really do appreciate it. And thank you all for coming. It warms my heart to see people who still care, people who want to hear about issues, people who want to hear about candidates, people who want to make informed choices. And I suggest that that's what our democracy, what our republic is based on. I know there's enough of that. It's too often, too easy to do in this game is to rely on old friendships and rely on, oh, I know that name or I know that person. And I'm glad to see people came out and people care to hear about issues, see their candidates, look them in the eye, hear what they have to say, hear what their plans are, hear what their ideas are. And that's why I'm doing this, ladies and gentlemen, because it has to be about you, not about anybody else. At the end of the day, you go into elected office for the people you represent. They have to come first. They have to be the only concern that you have. So I ask you to listen to all four of us tonight. No matter what the pin on your shirt says, no matter what your shirt says, no matter the yard sign in your yard, listen to all of us. Listen to our ideas. Listen to our plans. See who does have ideas, see who has plans, and you'll be able to judge from there who the right candidates are for you on May 15th. Thank you all for having me. I look forward to a great night. Next will be Sharon Breen. Good evening, everybody. My name is Sharon Breen, and I'm running for state representative of the 79th District. I am a lifelong resident of the 79th district. 
I have raised my family in this area. I have two grown sons and one granddaughter. I have over 40 years of business experience working in the private sector as a controller and a business manager. I know the effects firsthand of what is done in Harrisburg. I have always been interested in our country's direction. In 2009, with the Tea Party movement, I became more involved. I started out as a volunteer and later served on the board of directors. I ran for the school board, winning two terms. The two things that concern me the most about Pennsylvania and America are the tax on the attack on our Judeo-Christian heritage and excessive reckless spending by government at all levels. I have proven myself in addressing both concerns as an Alton Area School District board member and have been getting very positive feedback from voters of gratitude and encouragement. Why am I running? I come from a family that has served this nation in the military. I am very proud of their service. Now it's my turn to serve this community in Pennsylvania. Thank you. And now, Lou Schmidt. Let me first of all say what a great pleasure it is for me to be here with all of you this evening. I will admit that I have absolutely no political experience. I have neither sought nor served in public office ever before, which is to say that I have the exact same amount of experience that Donald Trump did when he became President of the United States. Like President Trump, I have spent my entire working life in the private sector. Like President Trump, I have tried and been successful at many different things, athletics, academics, and in my profession as an attorney. Like President Trump, I have started, owned, and run private businesses successfully, and I know what it takes to create and maintain jobs. Like President Trump, I will bring to government a long history of competing, fighting, and most importantly winning in private life. I will apply those lessons learned to the operation of government. Like President Trump, I have a Twitter. <laughs> Unlike President Trump, I rarely, if ever, use it. <laughs> and that is where the similarities end. Because I wasn't born into a rich family. I didn't have a wealthy father. Quite the opposite. I was the poor kid growing up on Dutch Hill here in Altoona, just a few blocks away from here. I was the dirty kid. I was the kid that other kids weren't allowed to play with. I was a kid whose house other kids weren't allowed to go to. I wasn't just the poorest kid on my block, I was the poorest kid in my neighborhood. I wasn't just the poorest kid in my class, I was the poorest kid in my school. I had to fight my way out of poverty. I had to fight hard to be successful, to be a successful person, and to have a successful life. Just like I will fight to be successful for those I represent in Harrisburg. Aside from, tax, aside from tax cuts and overall tax reforms, what specific steps would you take to improve economic development in our area? Judy Ward. Our governor has probably been the worst thing for business and business growth in our state. You know, we need a Republican governor very, very badly. Locally, we have, we're fortunate, we have a, an excellent economic development group, ABCB Corp, and they work tirelessly to help bring in new business and new opportunities. And I think as legislators, we need to make sure the environment is right with less regulation and more opportunities for our businesses and for people, for businesses to come here. So I think we need to take care of what the businesses that we have to help them be successful, but also set the climate for new business to come into the area. 
by having less burdensome regulations, better permit times, and any other ways that we can help businesses in our communities. Thank you. Dan Kiss. When we talk about regulations, when we talk about permits, let's actually talk about how to fix them. With permits, anyone who applies for, I don't know, let's say a farm and wants to put up a new barn, they gotta go to four or five different agencies on the state level to do the same thing. Common permitting, file one permit, it goes to each department. It's tracked in one system. Why that has been done, I'm not sure. It'll save our money, it'll make it quicker and easier for small business to get up and running or to expand and develop more. Beyond that, we do have to look at regulations. But it's not just enough to talk about regulations, we actually have to do something about them. Every single year, our government produces more regulations, whether it's through the legislature or whether it's giving a blank check to the executive agencies that are governed by our legislature through the budget. We need to sit back and do as the federal government is doing, as President Trump has suggested, and go line by line, day by day, page by page, to see what still makes sense. When I talk to small business owners all across this district, the one thing I hear is, well, we just get used to it. That's not good enough, folks. The last thing we need to do is increase and encourage private partnerships with public entities. You put those two things together and great things will happen. Thank you. Next is Sharon Breen. I think economic development should be handled by the private sector. I think they, they know what needs to be done and they do it best and they invest their own money in that and of course they're going to get it right. We do need to remove regulations. I work for a dairy farm that wanted to add on to their milking barn, and it took them two years to get their permits. And this is fighting with the state daily to try to speed up this process. <coughs> so the regulations are really out of control. And of course, the reason that the state gave is because there is a, a stream that runs through the property, which is Spruce Creek. And they said this is a high quality stream, and that's what slows down the process. Well, this family also has a business that they rent out property for people to fish on that stream. There's no way they're gonna destroy that stream. That stream is very important to them. And also, we need to reduce taxes. The tax burden on businesses here is just unbelievable. Any business person in another state is going to come in and check out the climate here before they would relocate here. And taxes is one thing that they're gonna look at. Why would they come here to lose money? That just doesn't make sense. We have to make it business friendly with regulations and we need to reduce the taxes. Thank you. Next is Lou Schmidt. You know, if I would to keep going last on that, you're not gonna need Gabe Norman to tell me I'm taking too long because there's not gonna be a whole lot left to say. Um, <laughs> Obviously, we need to reduce corporate taxes in Pennsylvania. 9.9%, .9%, we have the highest effective corporate tax rate in the United States of America. That tells businesses they're not welcome here. That tells them that they're gonna spend up to 10% of their profits in taxes in our state. We have to do three things. We have to do all three things. If we do one or two of these things, it's gonna be worse than if we hadn't done any of them. Number one, we have to cut the corporate tax rate. That has to be done. Number two, we have to cut regulations. I would propose introducing legislation that for every new regulation Pennsylvania enacts, three of them have to be reduced. The third thing we have to do, and it's very, very important, we have to control spending. It does no good to cut taxes and cut regulation if we don't control spending. And in fact, it's dangerous because there'll be a short period of time when we, tuck, when we cut taxes before the economy begins to grow that we won't have the growth in the economy bringing in more taxes to make up for the tax cut. So we have to be very, very careful to make sure that we control our spending and do all three of those things at one time. Our next question will start with Lou Schmidt. Oh, right. <laughs> How would you make school choice affordable for parents while at the same time strengthening our public schools? 
Well, one of the things I talk about, I don't hear a whole lot of people talk about, is uh, Article 3, Section 14 of the Pennsylvania Constitution, which says that the, the General Assembly shall provide for the maintenance and support of a thorough and efficient system of public education. I'm in favor of school choice. I'm in favor of vouchers. But we cannot cut off the oxygen to public schools because the legislature has a constitutional duty to fund public schools. If you take a child out, give them a voucher, and they go somewhere else with that money, and you take that money from the public school, if you don't save at least that much in expenses, you have cut funding to, in effect to that public school, and you have violated the state constitution. So we have to be very, very careful in how we set up SCART, uh, charter schools and in voucher programs. We cannot cut back on the funding to schools because I'll tell you the real danger. The real danger is that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and the courts are already doing this, is going to step in and they're going to say if the legislature isn't going to fund the schools in accordance with their constitutional duty, then we the courts will do it. And if you think it's bad funding schools through the legislature now, wait until five Democratic justices on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decide how schools get funded. are necessary for that. And I serve on the school board of the Alton area school district. But, and I have made this statement many times at board meetings, public schools need to compete. There is competition out there right now with charter schools, with cyber schools, and we've got to do a better job. We just can't sit back and say, just give us more money, more money, more money is going to fix it. Because they have more money. Our budget increases every year. And this year, they're looking at like six, a $6 million increase in the budget. So money isn't the issue. We've got to find out what the problems are. One of them is Common Core. They have had to push back the um, Keystone tests as far as the requirement for graduation because of this Common Core curriculum. They have changed everything um, from the way the teachers used to teach to this Common Core, and it's difficult. It's difficult for the teachers, it's difficult for the students, and I personally have seen it firsthand from a third grader trying to learn Common Core, and, and a parent working with this child, and trying to help them with their math. And at the end of the day, the little boy said, Daddy, if I take that to school, I, I'm gonna get it marked wrong and I'll be in trouble. Well, the little boy was trying to do it with Common Core. The father knew how to do the math question, and, and he was teaching his son how to do it correctly, and I said, you're both right. He's gonna be in trouble if he doesn't do it the Common Core way, but you're right that you're telling him how to do it. Thank you. Dan Kitts. I think one of the things that we've learned in the last 20 years of education is that the state and federal government are very, very, very poor at educating kids. Yes. These programs, whether it was No Child Left Behind or Common Core, do more to harm our students than they do to help our students. First and foremost, that needs to go. Standardized testing should not be tied to funding. It makes no sense that we have our teachers teach to a test when it's their job to teach. They're the experts. Let them do their job. That's how you make public schools competitive again. Let them do what they went to school to do, which is teach. Give more local control to education. After all, we know here how best to educate our students here versus how to educate a student in Philadelphia or a student in Pittsburgh. But on the same breath, we have to make sure that charter schools and cyber schools are competitive and on the same playing field as our local schools. We see this now that these cyber schools often take more money than a public school would take. That's not helping the taxpayers because that's coming out of your pockets to go to that school. So they have to be competitive. And they have to be for the right reasons. Go to the State Track and Field Championship meet in two weeks. You're going to see hundreds of schools from Philadelphia that are charter schools and cyber schools that are there for academic, not for academics, but for athletics. Keep the playing field equal and let our teachers teach. One size does not fit all with education. And 
that each parent should have the right to decide what schooling is best for his, their child. I'm a very big supporter of EITC tax credits. Uh, our, our family business supports those every year. And I think that's a really excellent way for students to get an education of, at a school of their choice. I also believe that we do have an obligation to fund public education. And I believe also that public education needs to, they need to fit their child. They need to, it needs to work for each individual child. Public education does need to be more competitive. And I think school districts are starting to see that. But it is very difficult with school districts with budgets because of our pension crisis. And that has drug all the, the money out of the public school system. So we need to work on funding our pension system so we can help our public school system. Thank you. Next question begins with Judy Ward. What measures do you advocate to secure our schools from violence, both from inside the school, but also from threats outside of the school? Thank you. Um, I have a bill that would have each student in grades 6 and 11 have a mental health checkup. And it would be with their routine physical that they get yearly, or in grade 6 and 11. It would, the results, it would be a screening exam that would be shared with the physician and with the parents. And it would not be shared with the school. But this would be a screening tool because we have a lot of students out there that are hurting. Many, many students out there that are hurting for one reason or another. I do think we need to have a choke point. We need to have one entrance into the school with even as much as a, a metal detector in some areas. That should be a local decision, though. But we do need to have armed guards because parents and students and teachers and staff deserve to feel safe where they go to work and they go to school. I've, um, my bill is with uh, one of the Democratic members and we've worked out details with PSEA and uh, School Board Association and I'm comfortable in hoping that that would be helpful to help some of the students that are hurting. It's easy to put up better doors, locking doors, put guards in place to arm teachers who are willing to go through the training. All of those things are easy to do. It's easy to make the school safer from the inside. What we have to worry about is making schools safe from the outside. Because that's where these threats develop. They don't develop just solely in the hallways and in the locker rooms. They develop at home. They develop at home with kids who are not being raised properly. They develop at home with broken families. We have a saying that our country is adopted when it comes to terrorism, see something, say something. Well, we need to adopt that with school bullying and with these issues that require that to turn kids into violent people. If you see a kid going south, or you see a kid who's sitting by himself at lunch with no friends, say something. Get involved in kids' lives again. Get back involved in their parents' lives. That's how we start to address this. It's not going to happen overnight, but if we start to get involved in our community members again and allow teachers to say something without the fear of being punished them themselves, by an administrator, or by those parents who think they're just tattling on their kid. That's how we have to do this. We need, as a community, to get back involved in our community's life instead of just pointing fingers at everyone else. Thank you. Sharon Breen. 
I believe that all the students in our school have the right to expect us to give them a safe environment to come to every day and not have to worry about being harmed at school. And I think some of the ways that we do this, we need to arm some teachers. And I think it needs to be done in a way where we don't put a plaque outside the door, this is the teacher that's armed, because that's the problem. These, these people know that these schools are not armed. They know there aren't people there with weapons that are gonna fight back, that they're an easy target. So I, I think it has to be voluntary, and I think they have to be trained and know what they're doing, but only the um, district would know who's armed and who is not. That would not be general knowledge. And we are securing our schools. Our schools are secured, and you have to have identification to get in. And another big thing, this happened in Parkland in Florida. This child was known to have these problems and people said, if there's a shooting at a school, it's going to be this child. And this was reported more than one time. We need to take this seriously. If there's someone out there that is having issues, we need to get involved and we need to take it seriously and not ignore it. Thank you. I'm afraid in the 90 seconds on such a complex issue, I can only give answers that are incomplete and uh, probably unsatisfying to you. I don't think we can divorce school violence from violence and other social problems in our society in general. It doesn't, school violence doesn't happen in a vacuum. Yes, I think we should arm teachers. Uh, I think that would be good because a lot of these shooters, they see these school shootings in the media over and over and over again. You have these, these folks who are troubled, who are in pain, who want to inflict pain on others. And they, what a better way to do that than to go to school and take a bunch of innocent people with you. I think Army teachers not just would be a good idea in order to protect the children, but if some of these folks started going into schools and teachers start shooting them, and I know, I know that that's a terrible thing, maybe they'll start to realize that maybe it's not such a grand way to go out uh, going in. You're not going to take out a bunch of innocent kids. You're probably just going to have a teacher that's going to shoot you instead. Uh, but you can't, I mean, Hundreds of, of kids get shot going in, in our inner city, going back and forth to school every day, not in, actually in the schools. It's so difficult to divorce the issue of school shootings from violence in general. And, and, and we have to keep in mind that we have to do a better job of, of detecting these folks who are on this path of destruction, detecting these folks that are so troubled and heading down this path of committing these mass atrocities. We have to, we have to do a better job, I think, of, of doing that. But we also have to make, be sure to balance the rights of the individuals, and also the rights to bear arms. These things have to be balanced. Uh, otherwise, we'll be living in a police state, and I don't think any of us want that. Next question starts with Lou Schmidt. Many residents are concerned about the increasing cost of living, utility bills rising, food and medical costs increasing, and such things as reassessment costs and increased taxes along with capital building projects, and so much more. How will you address these concerns and make it easier for families to stay and raise their children affordably in your district? Well, as I said before, and I, I know I keep coming back to the theme that a rising economic tide lifts all boats. If you cut taxes and cut regulation, and if we hold the, if we hold the line on spending, it allows job growth, it allows family sustaining jobs to come into our area. It does this across the state. I said before, I don't want to, I don't want to create enterprise zones across Pennsylvania. I want to turn Pennsylvania, the entire Commonwealth, into an enterprise zone. I don't think it's the job of the state legislature to look at any particular area of the state uh, and say, well, we should try to attract certain kinds of jobs, certain kinds of jobs. To me, that smacks of Soviet area era uh, industrial plant. I don't think the legislature should do that. I think what the legislature should do at the state level is to create an environment where we can have job creation across the Commonwealth, where we can encourage entrepreneurship, and innovation, and those things will help to grow our economy. Now, we've got folks on, we've got senior citizens on fixed income, and I know that taxes have been going up for these folks. Uh, I, I think that property tax relief has to, be, has to be addressed by the legislature. I think there's no question that these folks shouldn't have to make a choice, these seniors, between medicine and food or staying in their house. I think property taxes penalize a certain segment of society, and that is property owners. If you rent, you don't pay property taxes. You know, you get off spot free, so I think there has to be property tax reform. I think that'll go a long way to helping, especially with our seniors. Sharon Green. Yeah. Prices are going up, and 
taxes are going up. I have been out speaking to people the last couple months, and that is a big issue that they bring up. And we have to be careful. Anyone that has the ability to tax has to be careful how much we are taxing the citizens. They are losing freedom over this. The people are telling me that they're giving up their homes. I was talking to a couple and they told me that they were selling their home and they were going to move into one of these retirement homes because they just could not afford the expenses, they could not afford the real estate taxes, these real estate taxes have hit them very hard. And before I left that home that evening, the realtor came and the sign went off in front of their house. And I felt so bad for them. These people were almost 80 years old and they had a beautiful home, they lived all their life and now they're having a problem affording that home. And they had to give that home up and did not want to give it up. And we, we just, anyone in public office that has the ability to tax people has to take that very responsibly because you are hurting people out there and, and they are hurting a lot and we need to be aware of that. Thank you. Dan Kiss. I work for a small business and actually my office manager is here tonight, she's out in the hall. And we complain every week. We get a tax bill every single week. That tax bill doesn't go away. Every single week it's due whether we brought money in that week or not. It's got to get paid. We have to find a way. That happens to all of you too. Every single week those bills are due. Whether you have the money for it or not, you have to pay it. What we see is cost of everything goes up, but our salaries aren't going up. We're not making a whole heck of a lot more money than we were a couple of years ago. Why is that? Because our state continues to make our area and the whole state unfriendly for business. As Mr. Smith said earlier, we got to cut that corporate income tax rate. You drop it down a little bit and I can guarantee you small businesses like the one I work for aren't going to go buy a beach house. They're going to reinvest in their companies. They're going to reinvest in their people and their communities to give them an extra dollar or two so that they have a little bit more money to spend. We all got a little bit of a break on the federal level. We need to do it here on the state level too so that we have a little bit more to afford those bills. That's the quickest way. That's the easiest way. That won't start structural change. To do that, we need to encourage more businesses. We need to attract businesses here. We need to show people from outside our area how beautiful an area this is, and how amazing a workforce here that exists. We start doing that, and we can start to put a dent in this, but that promise not going to go away overnight. Thanks, folks. I also agree we need strong economic development. We need to cut our corporate taxes to allow businesses to come in and flourish. But we also have to provide those safety nets for those folks who need them. PACE and PACE net. And, and to raise the income levels on those so more people qualify for those services. Rent rebates, property tax rebates, we do those daily in our office. And those kind of policies, we need to remember you know, those folks who may need a safety net. So economic development, but also having those things in place to help those who aren't able and need a little hand up. question starts with Judy Ward. Aside from disaster or emergency situations, do you believe that major government, utility bodies, school boards, etc., should have the power to begin major capital projects without the funding in hand to complete the project? Should such, such expensive projects be required to appear as a referendum before financing and approvals are given to proceed? I very much believe in referendums. It's, you all are gonna pay the bill. We're all gonna pay the bill. So it should be a referendum. And um, I think school boards are in a really, they're in a tough spot because you, know, you have it here in the Altoona School District. Um, and that was great controversy. But at the end of the day, it's the citizens who are paying the bill and they should have a say in what is being spent. If I 
venture to guess, I think that Ms. Bream and Mr. Schmidt are going to agree with Ms. Ward and myself that referendum is a great idea. If you're going to be spending obscene amounts of money, then you better be asking the people who's going to be giving you that money before you spend it. But I don't think we just stop at capital projects. I think it should be on local, municipal, and school district taxes, period. If they're going to raise your school taxes more than 1%, that should be on the ballot before it's decided by seven or eight people that, or nine people, I guess, that we voted on. Our citizens should have that call first. If the county's going to raise your taxes more than a couple percent, we should have that say first. Same goes with the municipality. They shouldn't have all the power of deciding what, how much you pay and how and for why. Government works best at the smallest level. The smallest level is the municipalities, it is the county, it is the school districts. At that level, we can still participate in almost a direct democracy. And when it comes to taxes, we should have that say. Before they spend your dollars, you should have that say. Thank you. Sharon Green. Subject I know well. I, I four times tried to get our board to put this issue on the ballot so that the public, the voters, the taxpayers could vote and tell us how they felt about this project. And four times I was shot down. And my question to them was, why? Why are you afraid to put it on the ballot? Well, I think we all know the answer to that because the answer they would have gotten from the public would have been, no, we don't want to spend $38 million on the school. We also had other bids out there to go other ways and spend millions of dollars less than what they agreed to spend. And it's just wrong. We, we do need to put it out for the public to make that decision because it's something that you're going to be paying for for 30 years. And you don't go into a project of this magnitude paying interest only for 10 years because you cannot afford the payment. And then when you have another project paid off, you're going to bump that payment up the last 20 years to get this project paid off. Common sense and accounting tells me that we are paying 10 years more of interest on this project than we should, and that's interest on $88 million. And that's coming out of all of your pockets. If you're in the Altoona School District, you're going to be paying for this. And that is what has a lot of our seniors and a lot of our moderate income people in this area so upset. Thank you. I think we have to be very, very careful talking about direct democracy. Uh, the reason that our founding fathers put together our form of government, this is an elective representative republic. We don't have direct democracy because direct democracy, if you look back in history, look at Athens, look at these places that had it before, it always degenerates into either tyranny or anarchy. Our system has survived for over 200 years because it is a representative republic. We elect people to represent us. The other direct democracy simply cannot work. Uh, you can't have a referendum every time the school district wants to pay a parking lot or hire a janitor. You can't do that. You elect people to make those decisions for you. When I get into office, one of my priorities will be to revisit Act 34. Act 34 is the Taj Mahal Act. It was passed in the early 1970s. I want to tighten that up. If there's going to be capital expenditure above a certain level, then that will trigger a referendum. But only above a certain level. We have to allow our local government authorities and our school boards to spend money to maintain our schools and to maintain our public works without having to have elections every time they want to spend a dollar on something. So that's going to be a priority for me. I'll, look at, I'll, I'll, revisit, that, uh, I'll revisit that Taj Mahal Act. We'll tighten that up. And by the way, we'll tighten it up to the point where this project in Altoona would have been put to a referendum. Our next question is going to start with Lou Schmidt. We have heard promises from elected officials since the beginning of the Republic about what they say they will accomplish in their terms of office. Should the voters hold you accountable based on what you say you are for, or rather, what you actually get done, and how will you deliver on those promises? Well, there's an old saying that you campaign in poetry and you govern in prose. Um, 
The only promise I make to anybody, and the only promise I've made to anybody in my campaign is that I make no promises. Uh, the only thing I intend to do is to get into office and to do my best to represent the interests of the people in the 79th Legislative District. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to be able to accomplish, but I can tell you this, I'm going to try to accomplish a lot for the people that I represent. And it's up to the people. People talk about term limits. There is a term limit on, on uh, state representatives. It's every two years. Every two years, the people have the right to look at what I've done on their behalf in office and decide whether they're going to return me to private life or allow me to continue to represent them. And I trust the people to do that. The only promise I make is you'll never find a representative who will work harder or smarter or be more effective than I will be for you. I just want to bring one thing up before I go on. And uh, he mentioned the Taj Mahal Act. Well, this project passed the Taj Mahal Act according to Harrisburg. So that would not have stopped it and it should have gone on the ballot. But I want to go to Harrisburg to fight for the people. I want to fight to keep taxes under control. And the only way you're going to do that is to cut spending and stop thinking that you can just spend and borrow and then throw it onto the taxpayer because that has to end. I want to listen to the people. I want to hear what their concerns are, and I want to represent them in Harrisburg based on their concerns. And I, I want to represent all the people. And I will be a full-time legislator. I will not be part-time. I am retiring from my job this year, and I will, I will be spending all my time serving as state representative. Thank you. will make you a promise, and it's a promise that I believe every single elected official should make, and it should be the only thing that they say. You come first. In all instances, in all avenues, in every which way, the people that put you there, the people of your district, must come first over every single other thing. Plain and simple. That's a promise I make, and I better be held to that promise just like every one of us ought Thank you. Like Lou Schmidt, I make no promises, but as Representative McGinnis can tell you, there's a lot of things that get in the way of what you'd like to do. And sometimes your agenda doesn't always match up with the other agendas of the 202 other members. So um, I make no promises, but I think you need to look at the fruits and the votes of that particular elected official. And what they do and how they vote and how they represent you. And how you're treated when you go into their office, how you're treated when you speak to them about a concern, that's how a legislator should be judged, by how they treat their constituents and how they vote. Thank you. Next question starts with Judy Ward. The pension crisis in our state is getting worse with each passing day. What will you do in your first 100 days to create a solution to the pension crisis that does not unfairly hurt one group more than others who are caught up in this situation? I don't know that one person can solve that issue in 100 days. But as a caucus, we've taken very seriously pension reform. We have changed the plan, the plan design. Beginning next year, there will be three plans, two hybrid plans that employees can choose from and also a defined contribution plan, which is a 401k type program. People can, new employees and new legislators, newly elected legislators, and that means having come into office, whether you've been an incumbent or not, upon your election, you will go, you can choose to go into any of those three plans. After that, we need to fund our pension. And 
that's a hard thing for Harrisburg. That's a hard thing. We do, in each budget, try to put more money in, but it's like a monster that keeps growing and it doesn't let loose. So what I'm, I would like to do is if we're able to get the pension or the uh, liquor stores sold, I would like to take that money and put it in the pension fund to try to sell or to try to fund those pensions. Thank you. We receive about one to two percent per year return on the money that's invested through our pension program here in Pennsylvania. We pay those individuals who monitor that program tens of millions of dollars to return one or two percent. That same one or two percent that you and I could get by throwing it in a CD at our local bank. Why is that? Well, the reason that is is because our legislature has set a limit on what those folks investing your money are allowed to return. And what they do is they've given them, you can only return this little bit amount. It's set by state law, that amount that is returned per year. Well, we all saw since President Trump took over how everyone's 401ks have exploded and how the stock market has boomed. Well, it didn't affect Pennsylvania because we only got a 1.5% return. Why? Because our law stops it at that. It prevents our people managing our money from doing one penny better. That's where you start. Now, no, you don't let them go hog wild and turn this into 1929 again in a black uh, stock market crash. But what you do is allow them a little bit more ability to fund this pension. Allow them to get into the stock market a little bit to allow money to be made that's already out there to be made. Start it there. Thank you. We do need to fund this pension because we have promised these employees this money and it is our responsibility to fund it. Right now, the Alton Area School District has $180 million that is their portion of the unfunded state pension. So it's, it's an amazingly high figure. We need to start a 401k plan for new employees <coughs> with a match, just like you get in the private sector. The defined benefit plans are not sustainable. They cannot go on forever and ever, and we're finding that out and everybody's trying to put enough money in there to cover it, and there just isn't enough money to do that. So we have to stop what we're doing. We have to switch to a 401k, a straight 401k plan. And we also need to eliminate this pension for legislators. I think they need to lead by example and stand up and not take this pension, and it should not be part of their benefits package. That, that would definitely help. And we should not have career politicians who would need a pension such as this. Thank you. Lucian, I hate to burst all your bubbles, but if I stood here and told you I could solve a pension crisis in the first 100 days in office, I also have a bridge for you up the road to sell, because there's no way that this is going to be solved in 100 days. It may not be solved in 100 weeks. It may not be solved in 100 months. This problem has come about because of neglect on the a part of government officials for decades on adequately funding the pensions 20, 30, 40 years ago, much less could have been dedicated to the pensions, and we would be solved if we wouldn't have these problems today. Uh, my, uh, my thought on the pensions, uh, we've, we've, with some pension reform, and by the way, pension reform is not an event, it's a process. It's going to take a while to get pension reform in that really starts to work on these uh, unfunded liabilities. Uh, we've stopped some of the bleeding on the front end. We still have these unfund unfunded liabilities on the back end. My suggestion would be if we cut the corporate income tax, if we cut regulations, if we hold the line on spending, the economy begins to grow, more tax money begins to flow into the state coffers, that we dedicate a portion of that increased tax flow from a growing economy to solving the pension crisis. The next question starts with Lou Schmidt. How do we create a better retirement situation for state employees going forward without the costs falling to taxpayers of Pennsylvania? 
seeing that uh, Pat and Judy and I have to answer all the questions for us now. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know that I can expand on what I just said. Basically, what I just said, I think, is what we need to do. We've started pension reform on the front end. Put all of the state employees into a defined contribution plan, just like people get in the private sector, 401k. Stop the bleeding on the front end. Take increased tax revenues, dedicate that towards solving the pension, the pension unfunded liabilities on the back end. Look, just because you work for the state doesn't mean you should get a special pension. You're not a special citizen because you work because you're a state employee. You're, you're, you're as much a citizen of the Commonwealth, you're as equal as I am. You're not more equal, you don't get a better pension because you happen to work for an employer that's a state employer. So we put everybody into a 401k plan just like you get in private industry, just like private businesses give you. And you know what? If it does well, like all the rest of us, you do well. If it doesn't, you don't. But you shouldn't have the taxpayers guaranteeing you something in the future. We don't get that guarantee. Nobody else should. <laughs> Enterprise has, like I work with at work, you you uh, have people contribute to that plan. They can save on taxes by contributing to this plan. The employer provides a match. That check is written with payroll every two weeks or whenever your payroll is, and your pension is done. We are going to have to fund the pensions that have that are already out there promised to people. You can't just take that away from them. I have talked to people in going door to door, and that was one of their major concerns. And I said, that pension's been promised. I don't see you know, how that can be taken away from you. We do have to find a way. Hopefully, the economy will get better, or we can find some waste and cut waste and apply that money to these pensions. Thank you. Thank you. I think you've heard the starts of two good plans there. Yes, going forward, we do need 401ks. That doesn't solve the problem that we have right now. Uh, my brother's here tonight, and he's a school teacher. He's only been paying into Pacers for a little bit of time. I don't think he's ever going to see a dollar of a pension. The way it's funded right now, he's not going to get a dime of it. He's stuck. He can't go to 401k. I think we need to allow individuals to have the opportunity to claw themselves out if they so choose. If they believe that they can manage their money better than our state can, then they should be given that opportunity and not be stuck. But we still have to fund what's currently owed out there. And that's what I just spoke about a minute ago. We have to allow the people who manage our money to be able to make better decisions. After all, we're paying them tens of millions of dollars to make those decisions. If they are able to get us a better return on investment, we're going to have a better funded pension. You start doing those things, and we have the plan in place. 401ks, allowing people in the plan to make their own decisions, whether to stay with the pension or whether to move to a 401k and allow our money to be better managed. That's a start. Thank you. In a perfect world, we would have only the 401k type program. But when we did his, our historic pension reform last session, we were not able to get the governor to agree to change the plans to a 401k type program across the board. So we had to work with all the stakeholders and the three plans that we have were the best that we could get to. I'm not saying that we can't shoot for more, but we do need to fund those plans for the folks that were promised a retirement. We've promised that, and by law, we are bound to pay that bill. So we have to come up with ways, better investment strategies, and ways that we can to put extra money into that to pay down this obligation. Because it really, I, I said before, it's a monster. It really is. It will affect everything about our state until we get it under control. Thank you. Next question starts with Judy Ward. Are you in favor of simplifying our state tax system? And if so, how would you make taxation more fair and less burdensome 
for people who live here and still fund the needs of our state government to function. Um, I think a system that is based on income um, is a fair way to tax our citizens um, and to allow for those folks who aren't able to pay, allow for them to have a, a, a certain threshold where they don't need to pay. I think we need to help our veterans our, especially our disabled veterans and our senior citizens to help them and ease their burdens a little bit. Um, but I do believe that uh, the system we have of income-based taxes is probably the most fair system. Thank you. Thank you. When you talk about taxes, you have to also talk about spending. And in looking at spending, the first thing that we should do, and Senator Wagner has pushed this plan, and, and I believe it's a, a great idea, move to zero-based budgeting. What that means is you start every executive department, all the legislature and all the courts start at zero dollars, and you have to prove every penny why we need it and what it's for. That in and of itself will begin to cut a lot of the waste that currently exists in our state government, and it'll actually reduce our tax debt, reduce our tax burden. Start there with zero-based budgeting. Go into some of these executive departments, and Game Commission is one of my favorite whipping boys for that, because they raise our fees every single year. We're about to get another mega fee raise on hunting licenses and fishing licenses. Make them get audited. Show that they actually are needing that money that they say that they have. They're raising money outside of the legislature. That money you pay for a license never goes into any state programs except for their own. Where is it going and how? Start with that. Yes, we do need to have an income tax, but what we don't need are things like a death tax. When my grandmother died, she was more or less penniless. The state government took their chunk out of her. No need for that. Get rid of that tax tomorrow. Start with that, folks. Thank you. or retirement and I know that's been discussed in Harrisburg and I, I think that's just awful we have caused businesses to leave this area when they leave they take the jobs with them so we have more people unemployed than we should so every time we lose a business and we create unemployment we have more we have less people paying into the tax system we need to expand our businesses. We need to become a state that's friendly to business, to have them want to come here, provide uh, good jobs, family-sustaining jobs, where everyone can pay less tax because we have a thriving and a growing economy. That's what we need here in Pennsylvania. And we've been going through this deterioration of all of these businesses just packing up and leaving because of the tax structure. And right here in Altoona, we have a horrible tax structure through the Altoona School District. They charge a business privilege tax, and it's not on net income. It's on gross income. So they get your money before you ever get your money. And sometimes your profits are really thin. The district actually gets more money than what you're profiting. And that is wrong, and I, I will work hard to try to clean these things up. Look, if I get elected to the state legislature, it's not like I'm exempt from paying taxes. I'm a taxpayer too, and I'll continue to be a taxpayer. I hate taxes. I wish I could stand here and tell you all that I could eliminate every single tax on earth, but we can't. Government is the most necessary of all evils, and therefore the most evil of all necessities, but we have to have a government. We have to find a way to fund it. The question is, the way, the way that we fund it, is it fair to the citizens? That's the real question. Uh, I would, as I said before, I would slash that corporate income tax. And by the way, they call it a corporate income tax. It's an indirect attack, tax on all of us. Because what do corporations do when their taxes go up? They raise their prices. We pay more. 
They slash the, the dividends that they pay out. So we don't get dividends if we invest in that corporation. They lay off employees. It rises, so it causes rising unemployment and more costs for local government. They move to automation. These are all things that are an indirect tax on us. I would slash that corporate income tax. I would like, us, I would like to see Pennsylvania move more in the direction of a value-added tax or a consumption tax and have property tax relief and have corporate tax relief, encourage businesses, grow the economy, more tax revenue comes in, and it becomes, it becomes a spiral of prosperity that allows us to continue to cut tax rates. That's the answer. Our next question starts with Lou Schmidt. Do you support term limits, ending perks and pensions for elected officials and or a part-time legislature to reduce the size and scope of state government? How many of these questions are left? Do we have? Look, I'm closer to the lights than you guys. Much warmer for me than it is for you. Um, I, look, here's, here, here's what comes. I said this earlier. The Constitution provides for term limits. The term limits are two years. If the people wish to return a legislature back, a legislator back to private life after two years, the people have the right to do that. We ought to trust the people. I don't want to stand up here and be arrogant and be conceited and say the people are so dumb that if I get into office, they're just going to keep re-electing me term after term after term. And I have to be the one to say when I leave. I trust the people to know when it's time for me to leave. And I will tell you this. I, my goal, if I'm elected as a legislator, my goal is after my service is ended, is to leave that office and to have every one of my constituents say, Lou was a great representative. We wish he would have stayed I, I do believe we should have term limits, and I personally have stood before different groups of people, and I will limit myself to no more than three terms, because I think we need citizen representatives and not career politicians. And that's the problem with career politicians. They get into Harrisburg, and it's all about them. It's all about their reelection. It has nothing to do with the people. They forget about the people that they represent, and that needs to end. And I will not take a pension, and I will not take a per diem perks. And as far as Pennsylvania becoming part-time, having a part-time legislature, I think it's something we should look into. Many other states do that. I don't know if you're aware, but our legislature, legislators are the second highest paid in the entire country, second only to California. They're costing us a lot of money. And in addition to costing us a lot of money, every time they're in Harrisburg, they're coming up with something else that we have to adhere to or another tax, and it's just wrong. I, I think a, a part-time legislature should definitely be explored. Thank you. I do believe in term limits, and I pledge myself two terms. The reason I do that is not because I don't trust the voters. It's because I don't trust the other politicians in Harrisburg. I'll give you a good example. Senator Greenleaf, who's down there right now, he's retiring. His son's running right now, and they have the same name. Guess who's going to get elected, folks? Come on. That's why we need term limits, so we don't have these little dynasties created from father to son or whatever the case may be. It's because I don't trust the rest of Harrisburg that I'm willing to do what I believe is right, what I believe our founders intended, which is to be citizen legislatures, not legislator citizens. Thank you. I also believe in term limits. Um, I think in the House, six terms is more than enough, which is 12 years. And in the Senate, the same, three terms. Um, the pension, I, I personally don't take a pension. I don't fault someone who does. Some of the younger members have young families and I, I don't fault them for that, but I personally don't take a pension. And I don't take a per diem either. I use actual expenses, I love my mileage, and those sorts of things. 
um, whether a part-time or a full-time, I'm a big believer in a constitutional convention. And um, Steve Bloom in the House and Senator Eichelberger in the Senate both have bills that would allow for a constitutional convention. And it would put a referendum on the ballot and people would decide. And if they decided they wanted a constitutional convention, there would be representation from each Senate district and those people would convene for a summer in Harrisburg and they would decide the terms, the pay, all of those issues that, that can be decided in a limited constitutional convention. Um, I'm a big supporter of that. Thank you so much. To answer your question, there are two questions left. All oh, right. <laughs> make them short. And to make everyone in the audience, I did not give any of the candidates these questions, but boy, you keep coming up with the next question I'm going to ask if that with your answers. Are you in favor of a limited constitutional convention <laughs> to realign priorities within the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government? And if so, what are the top three things you would work to change? Judy Ward. Obviously, I do agree with the constitutional convention. Um, and it's, it's a limited constitutional convention. So they can't decide. Uh, you know, there's only certain things they can decide. They can't decide uh, about Second Amendment rights or any such thing. It is very limited to the size and scope of our representation. So I'm a big, as I said, a big fan of that. Um, what three things? What three things would you change? What three things would I change? Um, I probably would institute term limits. That would be one of them. Um, I think another one would be um, to have everybody, instead of the per diems, um, use actual expenses. I think in the past, per diems have been abused, which is uh, sad, but it's, it's easier. It's, it's an easier system, but um, you know, I'm from the business world, and so we have actual expenses. So um, those are the things that I personally would, would be in favor of. Thank you so much. So it's quick and easy. Yes, I agree in having a limited constitutional convention. The three things that we need to address, in my opinion, most importantly, one term limits. We've already talked about that. Number two, any law that is passed equally applies to the legislature as it does the citizens. And number three, if we don't get a budget passed on time, we don't get paid. term limits. I think there definitely should be term limits. They should explore turning our state into having a part-time legislature and eliminate pensions. Thank you. <laughs> eliminate pensions for the legislators. Lushman. I really want to get to that last question, so I'm going to say uh, yes, I think we should have a limited constitutional convention. I don't think I can add to what these folks have proposed, except to say one thing. I would personally like to see judicial reform. I think we have too much activism amongst our judges. I think they need to be more accountable. <laughs> I'm not going to take long. <laughs> most, most legislation is crafted at the committee level in Harrisburg. What committees would you seek to be assigned to that match your skill set and would make you most effective to achieve real positive results for this area? Well, I think, of course, being an attorney, you naturally think of the Judiciary Committee. That's the committee that, uh, that uh, sets the rules and regulations for the, uh, for the Judiciary and uh, for the legal community. So that's certainly, that would certainly, I think, be a natural, a natural fit for me. I would be the Judiciary Committee. I, I would like to get on the Transportation Committee. I think that transportation is a vital issue for our local area. 
uh, highways, bridges, uh, our infrastructure. We, we have absolute needs here um, that are not being met. We need to plan for the future. I've talked about uh, a rising tide lifting all boats. We have to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place that when that rising tide comes, the water doesn't go flying out of the, of the area. We have, to have, uh, we have to have an infrastructure plan going forward. And these things take time. You know, PennDOT plans years into the future. Uh, when it comes to infrastructure uh, development. So those, I think those two committees would be, uh, be interested. Of course, appropriations, everybody wants to get on appropriations because they handle all the money in Harrisburg. But that, that's a tough committee to get on. But I think I would like to get on appropriations for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one is because I think that I would like to have some oversight over how money is spent in Harrisburg. And I think I could do a good job making sure that your tax dollars are spent wisely. I've been um, working for the largest dairy farm on the East Coast for the past 17 years, and I have some experience in ag, and it is our largest industry in Pennsylvania, and I would like to serve on that committee. I think I would be well suited to serve on the education committee with the time I have spent on the school board and what I have learned through that position, and the government committee, the regulations, and how they affect businesses. Thank you. Kind of like Mr. Schmidt, of course, it'd be a natural fit to go on the Judiciary Committee or the Long Governance Community. But I don't know that that's necessarily just the one place to pigeonhole. I would like to be in agriculture. Why? Because I've taken an interest in it ever since I've gone into this. Because I look around this district, which is mainly rural, and seeing farms die left and right. And that worries me. That worries me because that's our food, and really that's our tradition, and that's our heritage. But beyond that, what I'll say is, I think I can make it then. I can make some damage no matter where they try to show me or where they try to put me. The one thing I would like to see, though, is to stop groups from writing legislation. For example, when they rewrote Megan's Law, which was declared unconstitutional not that long ago, when we fixed it in the meantime, a couple months here, it was the state police who wrote it. And my friends in the state police general counsel's office told me that when they put it on Governor Corbett's desk, they knew it was unconstitutional. How and why could that ever be acceptable to put a law on the governor's desk that they knew was going to get shut down and that they knew we were going to spend millions of dollars defending? We need to get our legislatures back into writing the laws and get people back into writing the laws and not these groups who think they know better. Thank you. I won't be long either. <laughs> Uh, as a nurse, uh, a great fit for me in the House has been on the Health Committee. I also serve on the Human Services Committee in the Senate. Those committees are combined. Um, I've also uh, wanted to be on an Ag Committee because my legislative district currently um, is very agricultural, and uh, I do a lot of work with Farm Bureau. So um, the Ag Committee would also be a great fit for me. So thank you. Opening statements, I'm going to remember we're doing closing statements. <laughs> and we're going to start with Judy Ward. Let me tell you what a conservative looks like. A conservative believes in the rights of the unborn. I've been endorsed by the Pennsylvania Pro-Life Federation. A conservative believes in the Second Amendment rights. I'm the only candidate in the race for Senate with Second Amendment endorsements. I have an A rating from the NRA, and I've been endorsed by Firearm Owners Against Crime. A conservative believes that through growth in the economy and the private sector, we will see prosperity. I have a 100% voting record with the Pennsylvania Chamber and the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association, and today received an endorsement from NFIB, which is the Small Business Advocacy Group. A conservative believes that more mandates are not the answer. I've been endorsed by the Pennsylvania State Nurses Association, the non-union nursing organization. A conservative believes in the principles of the Republican Party, 
and helps other Republican candidates. A true conservative has been in the Republican Party longer than two years. I've spent nearly 20 years in Republican politics, helping our party locally with county commissioners, county judges, and our statewide officials, and nationally to what I'm most proud of is helping President Donald Trump get elected. I'm a lifelong resident of this county and have raised my children here. I've served and given back to my community as a citizen and also as a state representative. I've been able to help the community by bringing home much needed grant dollars. I have the respect of my colleagues in Harrisburg as well as my community back home. Let me tell you what a conservative does not do. A conservative does not pander to a union that bullies people into joining their cause or promoting their ideas. This is the same union that has donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to Governor Wolf's coffers. I think we need to just not just say that you're pro-life or pro-Second Amendment, but you need to have ratings and people and organizations to back you up. Our next state senator should not just have shown up, should not just have become a Republican, and should not be fighting with labor unions who support Governor Wolf. Our next state senator should be a conservative voice and an advocate for you and the 30th district. I humbly ask for your vote on Tuesday. Thank you. Out, said Dan Kiss is a liberal. That's a lie. Flat out lie. Let me tell you something, folks. I grew up in Johnstown. My mom and dad were Kennedy Democrats. They were Kennedy, excuse me, Reagan Democrats. And they voted for President Trump. I switched because of President Trump. Because I was tired of seeing what was done by local parties. I was tired of seeing what was done by the establishment and not letting someone who cared about this country and cared about the folks in it, but wanted to protect themselves and wanted to protect their way and to keep themselves in power. Yeah, I used to be a Democrat. That does make me a liberal. And I've never hid from that fact. To try and say that that disqualifies me, it doesn't even bear a response because it's so ludicrous. Winston Churchill said, some men change their principles, excuse me, change their party because of their principles. And some people change their principles because of their party. I don't need to say any more about that. But I'm gonna tell you one little story. Early on in this race, and really nobody in this room knows this, I was approached by a very conservative lobbying group down out of Harrisburg. They offered me $100,000 for my campaign. Now, for all the political folks in the room, they're saying, oh my goodness, that's humongous money. I walked away. I walked away because I was not going to be bought and paid for. I walked away because my promise is to you, plain and simple. I could put my name on every billboard, on every sign, on every television channel, but then I'd have been bought and I'd have been paid for. I don't care about a group's endorsement. I care about your endorsements. I didn't fill out those surveys because that's not what matters. It doesn't matter what some group says about me. It matters what you say about me. It matters what the voters in this district think. And plain and simple, there's a big difference, folks. I fight every single day. I go to court to overturn poor legislation, to fight for people's rights. And there's no one else in this race who can say that. And there's no one else who comes close to being able to do that. That's what it is. Plain and simple. It's not about doing it forever and being a uh, Republican forever, because there's lots of rhinos, folks. There's a whole lot of rhinos. It's about looking the man in the eye, looking the woman in the eye, seeing who they are, what they believe in, and what they can do for you. Because that's what this is about, folks. What can they do for you? Thank you. committee for putting this event on.
tonight. And thank you to everybody who came out to listen to us tonight. Come Tuesday, you will have a choice to make regarding the 79th district. I believe I am the candidate with a proven track record of standing up for the people in this area. I have been steadfast in my resolve not to spend $88 million and put this area in debt for the next 30 years. There were other ways to achieve the goals. This has been a tough loss, but I, I know how it will impact the citizens of this area. I have had other successes while serving on the school board. When I first got on the board, it was brought to my attention that the bleachers in our field house were defective and needed to be replaced. And I really liked those bleachers. They were wood, they were easier to sit on, but the unfortunate fact was they were pulling away from the wall and they were pulling away so far that a child or an adult could have fallen from those bleachers that were 20 feet up in the air. And I pushed to get that replaced and it was done. Um, one of our elementary schools badly needed a playground. They had tried to raise money to uh, put some playground equipment in for the students and they, they come up short, they couldn't do it. And I pushed to get that money and have, have that playground for those children and that was money well spent. I pushed for the district to reimburse the teachers for the money that they have to take out of their own pockets for the students to get their classes ready when the students come back. And I don't think the teachers should have to spend their own money. The district gets funding from the state and we have local funding and federal funding and I think we need to reimburse those teachers. They should not have to take that out of their pockets. And more recently, I was successful in getting the district to accept a gift from the class of 1966. This gift was our national motto, In God We Trust. It is now proudly displayed in our boardroom. And as I said earlier, I am a lifelong member of the 79th. I love Pennsylvania, and there's no other place that I want to live. But we can do better for the citizens, and we must do better. We need to get the government off the backs of the citizens. I will fight for government to live within its means and not continue to pass the burden of overspending onto the taxpayers. I will work on scaling back the gas tax that is the highest in the entire country. I will work for sustainable pension reform and push to remove the pension from the legislators' benefit package. Legislators need to lead by example and not take a pension for, for themselves. <clears throat> Many have died so we can be free, and I will protect that freedom. I am pro-life from conception to natural death. I am pro